I said earlier in today's lecture that revision is partly a matter of extension, of extending your knowledge of a topic. And to that end, I thought it might be interesting to uh, think about sense and reference in the context of expressions known as indexicals and demonstratives. Let me offer you an illustration of what I have in mind. Um, so I say to you, Descartes is a skeptic. And you say to me, Descartes is not a skeptic. Now we've contradicted each other in this case, I suspect, and we, we need to have an argument to work out who's right. Um, and in fact, I suspect you're right here. I don't think Descartes was very serious about skepticism at all. Uh, but that, that's, that's another story. Uh, that's another story. Now here's a different conversation we might have. I might say to you, I am a skeptic. And you might say to me, I am not a skeptic. Um, and here, of course, we haven't contradicted each other because you've said something about you and I've said something about me. No contradiction there at all, no problem. So this I functions quite differently from the way that a proper name like Descartes functions, or so it seems, because it seems that what I picks out varies depending on the context of utterance. When you utter, I am a skeptic, the I refers to you. When I utter the same sentence, my I refers to me. Descartes doesn't work like that. Very simple. So here we have a nice contrast between names and indexicals. We can take this slightly further. So you might say to me, that is a good argument. And I might say to you, that is not a good argument. And here it's unclear whether we've contradicted ourselves. That very much depends on whether when you say that, you're demonstrating the same thing that I'm demonstrating when I say that. If we're demonstrating different things, then we haven't contradicted each other. If we're demonstrating the same thing, then only one of the things that we have said can be correct, at most one. Uh, so these expressions here are called uh, demonstratives. That here now and the rest are called demonstratives, as opposed to the index calls like I and now. So an index call or a demonstrative is an expression whose referent depends on an aspect of the context of utterance. Now, this is only a loose approximation. I'm not offering this as a definition, and nor am I attempting to give you a clear distinction between index calls and demonstratives. In fact, I just sort of accidentally misclassified uh, here and now, calling them first index calls and second demonstratives. I don't think it matters very much whether they're index calls or demonstratives. I think the key feature here is that the reference depends on context of utterance in some moderately systematic way. So I, for example, we might say, here's the rule. I refers to the utterer. We might think that's the kind of rule that takes us from the context of utterance to an understanding of what it is that has been talked about there. Or you might say that now refers to the time of the utterance. So you say, you know, now it's time for you to go. And I say, you know, sometime later, uh, now it's time for me not to go. Right? But if the utterances occur at different times, we're talking about different times, and therefore we may not have contradicted each other. Very simple so far. Just try to get a handle on what we're talking about when we're talking about index calls and demonstratives. But we're quickly going to get into trouble here. Not just trouble with bears, but also philosophical trouble. So let's think about this sentence, a bear is about to attack me. Here's Perry. When you and I entertain the thought that we might each express by saying, a bear is about to attack me, we behave similarly. We both roll up into a ball and try to be as still as possible. Good plan. But when you and I both apprehend the thought that I'm about to be attacked by a bear, we behave differently. I roll up into a ball and you, being so kind and thoughtful, run off to get help for me. So Perry is pointing out I take it a clear distinction between the different ways that indexicals work. Very simple. Nothing's supposed to be complicated here. Second example, getting a little bit more complicated now. So go, go back to this, a bear is about to attack me idea. We can contrast two thoughts that might have, one involving a name. So a bear is about to attack Steve and the other involving an indexical. Oh, sorry. A bear is about to attack me. Now, here's the really curious thing. Perry points out this. I might have absolutely terrible amnesia, right? So I might know nothing at all that's true about myself. I may have no true 
knowledge at all about who I am, what my name is, uh, where I was born, how old I am, my gender. All of this might be entirely opaque to me. All of that self-knowledge is gone. Perhaps this is brought on by the fear of the bear. In this case, a thought along the line, a bear is about to attack Steve, will have quite different significance from a bear is about to attack me. When I'm thinking a bear is about to attack me, I'm definitely curling up into a ball. But because of my amnesia, there's no other thought involving a name or a description that will do the same thing. Why is that? Because I won't know that that name or description applies to me. So I might be thinking a bear is about to attack the person who is standing here. But if I've got no idea who that is, right? if I've got no idea who it is, uh, then it won't be me that's curling up into a ball. So there is a difference, points out Perry, between these two thoughts. The thought involving the indexical has an immediate implication for action. The thought which doesn't involve the indexical doesn't have that same immediate implication for action. It depends on some further piece of knowledge or inference. Reminds me a little bit of Russell's principle of acquaintance. Funny that. All right, so here's the second idea. Perry says, indexicals are essential in the sense that you can't replace a thought involving an indexical with a thought involving a name or a description. Uh, you need those thoughts involving the indexical in order to explain the behavior. Very good. So we've been thinking about indexicals and demonstratives. I wanna suggest that there are two applications that we can make here. Um, one concerns what I call the mystery of sense. So the mystery of sense is this. We have excellent arguments from Frege for distinguishing sense from reference, but we also have systematic failure by many philosophers over many years to say anything informative and true about what senses are. This is the mystery of sense. We know that we need them in order to characterize points of view. We've got the first idea what they are. So here we are, we're looking through a window, uh, perhaps, and we might think some thoughts about this marvellous elephant. Um, you might think, looking through one window, that elephant has paint on its ear. And then looking through another window, you might think, that elephant has paint on its trunk. But in order to draw the conclusion, that elephant has paint on its ear and paint on its trunk, you seem to need a further step. You seem to need the idea that that elephant, the one you see through this window, is that elephant, the one you see through the other window. So it turns out that there's an identity statement, this elephant is that elephant, this is that, which can be informative and play a role in allowing you to draw this conclusion or not. What that tells us briefly is that the kinds of consideration which Frege offers for distinguishing sense and reference apply not only to thoughts concerning individuals where the thought involves something analogous to a proper name, Superman is Clark and the rest, but also to thoughts involving demonstrative constituents like this is that. I should say, by the way, this is indeed uh, entirely one elephant. And if the windows were close enough together, you might realize that. But you have to imagine a situation where, you know, the elephant's walking along and you're seeing it through a series of windows from the very grand uh, house that you're currently inhabiting. If Frege's right, that we need to postulate sense, not just reference, in order to characterize points of view, then we need to postulate sense, not just for names, but also for indexicals and demonstratives. And that I think deepens what I call the mystery of sense, because it's very hard, perhaps impossible, to find in the philosophical literature, a good, carefully justified, widely accepted account of what the sense of an indexical or a demonstrative might be. Here's a second application. This takes us right back again to the start of the course, the argument from massive reduplication. You see, several of you were offering me an objection here, and I said, you know, we'll, we'll come back to this objection in the context of sense and reference. And there I was speaking the truth. We will do that. So here's the argument from massive reduplication. I won't take you through it right now because I suppose that you could go back and work through it again if you've forgotten the argument. So it would be not right for me to do that now. What I do want to do is just to remind you that several people rejected the claim that for follows from 
two and three. So they thought that although all your thought is based on knowledge by description, a massive reduplication is possible. It doesn't follow that you might not be thinking about anything for all we know, because you could have thoughts like, the book nearest to me is on fire. So by using that element me, the indexical, the book nearest to me, you're kind of anchoring your thought to the world using a description. And therefore, um, it's not true that you might not be thinking about anything in particular. And I want to say, so this, this was the objection. The idea was that four doesn't follow from two and three. Right? And I want to say, if we, if we look carefully here, what we notice is that the uh, indexical element, me, is indeed anchoring thoughts to this world and not some sort of clone of it somewhere else far away. That's correct. But it's sneaking in this term me into the description is actually not compatible with the claim that we're relying entirely on knowledge by description. But go back to what Russell says about acquaintance. He says, whenever the relation of supposing or judging occurs, as when you judge the book nearest to me is on fire, the terms to which the supposing or judging mind is related by the relation of supposing or judging must be terms with which the mind in question is acquainted. Uh, so what are these terms? Well, one of the terms, of course, will be the me. One of the terms will be the me. But in order to be acquainted with me, I need something more than knowledge by description. That was the lesson from Perry on the bear. The thought about me isn't equivalent to any thought involving some description, because after all, I might not know that any description applies to me because I have this radical case of amnesia. So the book nearest to me is on fire is not properly speaking something that we could know just by description, because to know it by description, we'd have to be able to know every term or every constituent of it by description. And therefore, we'd have to know the constituent corresponding to me, the term, by description, which we can't. So we can see here, by thinking more carefully about indexicals and demonstratives, that actually there's no challenge to the fact that four follows from two and three. That's not to say, of course, that there aren't other ways to challenge this argument. Of course, there are, absolutely. But that particular challenge, although initially seems promising, turns out not to work. Four does indeed follow from two and three. And that matters because this shows us that understanding points of view requires understanding not just thoughts that we involve counterparts of names like Superman and Clark Kent, but also understanding indexical and demonstrative thoughts. Thoughts like, a bear is about to attack me, or that elephant is this elephant.